Mr. Jeff Weiss is our next presenter. He serves as the managing director of SEICs at Distributed Sun LLC. Mr. Weiss is the co-founder and managing director at ASAP Ventures LLC um, and investment, their investment arm. Prior to forming ASAP Ventures in June of 2000, he was president of the ComQuest Group, helping e-business and information technology entrepreneurs to establish valuable market positions by providing strategy, marketing, and capital formation advice. Please welcome to the podium, Jeff Weiss. Thank you very much. Good morning. So, um, so this is the, um, uh, the, the Cheerios and, um, and, and School of Hard Knocks part of the conversation because it's about uh, the folks who give the party. So a long time ago in business, I was told uh, that it's the customer who gives the party. So it's not the CEO, it's, not, it, it's the people who pay. And in the um, energy business, I've learned uh, that in the energy business, the person who gives the party is the person with the money. Because we are in the infrastructure business, and it costs a lot of money to get started. So when, we, so when we're talking about resilience and reliability and EMP and everything we're talking about, there's a layer of it, which is uh, my role for the next 15 minutes to talk about, which is about where the money comes from and how it gets funded, which of course, which is, of course is complex. So I have a, a couple of questions I, I want to ask uh, just to get a sense um, of, of, of folks who are here. So how many people feel they have at home a week supply of food? Okay, how many people feel at home they have a month supply of food? It's a very prepared group. How about six months? Very, I'm going to come to your house. How, how many people uh, have a personal generator that they feel would work for a month? Okay, a smaller group. And, and how many people have their own renewable generation that they feel would last indefinitely? Great. So part of the reason I'm asking that is from a energy and electricity point of view, sitting here in 2015, while we're talking about resilience and reliability and potential risks and threats, um, at the same time, with the grid and with where we get all the electricity that we use at our homes, at our businesses, in our governments, um, we're at the very front edge, right, of the, of the distributed generation revolution. So just like um, Nicholas Negroponte at MIT said 25 years ago there was going to be what, he, what was then became known as the Negroponte inversion, which was that anything that was wired became wireless. He was talking about the telephone, and anything that was wireless was going to become wired. Um, and of course, these are no longer wired, and that which we do with them is radically different than that which we thought about when it used to be what we called plain old telephone service. Well. I will tell you that that which um, is wired is going to become wireless and, and the opposite for electricity. What do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? Because th this, is, this is very meaningful to a from a resilience and a reliability point of view. Um, what I mean by that is virtually all of the electricity that's distributed and used everywhere is centralized today. It's managed by the grid, it's produced centrally, and the utility model of, of um, ha in the way that the public service commissions regulate utilities uh, generally have a common structure than where generation, transmission, and distribution are all commonly regulated and threaded together. As we go to the distributed generation revolution and work towards what will be a more resilient set of infrastructure, we're also at the front edge of what you would think of and can start to call energy democracy. So the great thing about energy democracy, right, is that the capital markets will finance different subsets of that differently if they're unfettered and allowed to do that. And in the, the reason that, hasn't, that didn't happen 10 years ago, 50 years ago, or 100 years ago is because the, because the cost and the, and, the, and the infrastructure needed to build a large grid was truly enormous and truly something you only wanted to do one time and have one group do. So we set up as a country public service commissions and utilities 
in an oligopolist style where they, they provide for our power and our generation. Now, with the revolution that's going on from a technology and a cost point of view, we're at the front edge of being able to create our own locally. And do, do the folks who are doing this believe that 20 years from now, 100% of the grid will be distributed? No, they don't. But if we get to 20% of the grid being distributed, the impact from a resilience and reliability point of view, well managed, is truly enormous. Is truly, which, is, which gets back to the question that I asked as to how many people have how much food and how much power at their own home. It's the same concept. Most of you, I would wager, who raised your hands are, are getting nearly all your electricity from the grid. And yet, you're investing in and spending money and time and thinking about your backup and how you're doing it personally. And as you're doing that personally, um, it's the same decision that's being made for school, needs to be made for schools, for hospitals, for military, for our critical infrastructure in our society. So renewables, as a subset of that, right, have benefited, everyone knows this, from very sharp declines in component prices, right? Solar panels, which are um, to more than two-thirds of all renewable investments, um, have come down on 80 or 90 percent in price. Uh, panels, which used to be five or ten dollars a watt, are now um, 55 cents a watt, and inverters and everything else have come way down. So a way of measuring that, just, for, just to give you a, a piece of data, is that in 2008, right, if all of us in the room wanted to install a bunch of solar on average anywhere in the United States, if you were an investor, you would ask the question, how many cents per kilowatt hour do I need to be paid every month in order to recoup my investment and give me an above hurdle return on capital? And those are the words that investors use. Well, the answer to that question, given the very high cost, just, just um, in the mid, middle of the last decade, would have been about 50 cents a kilowatt hour. That's a very high number, and no one pays 50 cents a kilowatt hour unless they're maybe in parts of Hawaii. So by definition, you know when I tell you that number that every solar panel that was put up in that period of time was put up with a deep subsidy. Someone was subsidizing it because investors are only going to invest if they're going to get a return on their capital. So if, if you needed 50 cents, and by the way, at that time, the average retail electricity price in the United States was just over 12 and a half cents a kilowatt hour. Again, average across all 50 states. Today, if you ask the same question with the amount the prices have plummeted, two things have happened. Number one, the average price of retail power has increased, right? It's, it's just shy of 14 cents a kilowatt hour, average nationwide at retail. Um, at the same time, the average price you need as an investor, average nationwide, is about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. So we're very close to total grid parity. And I told some people last night that in the middle of Texas, solar is now being banked, meaning successfully financed um, at, a, at an acceptable market rate of return to investors where they're, where they're selling the power for 3.8 cents a kilowatt hour. 3.8 cents a kilowatt hour. So solar in that part of Texas, in that example, beats natural gas. Well, that's the leading edge data point, right, about this inversion, about the, the prospect of energy democracy. Because if you can do that, it, it's just unlocking a tremendous potential. So what's happening from the capital markets point of view? It turns out that investors are really mean. They're, they're mean because they're very narrow-minded. Sorry, I'm, and I, I, they're narrow-minded in that they don't really care about what you care about. They don't care about resilience. They don't care about reliability. And they really don't care about things that are extra backup, things that are not needed every day. They only care about one thing. They care about return on their money. Right? And the capital markets, I'll tell you a secret. The capital markets have an infinite supply of money. Infinite. For one thing. For long duration, low risk investments. Did I say anything about resilience in that sentence? Did I say anything about electricity in that sentence? No. I mean, I could be talking about buying tables and chairs. As long as, long as you have something to offer to the capital markets that's long duration and low risk, there's infinite money for it. So our challenge in industry, our challenge in this room, our challenge in thinking about resilience is not to force the investors to think like we think because they'll never do that. They'll never change. They never have changed and they won't change. 
Our challenge is to understand their thinking, right? And then to understand what we do and what we need, which is different. We know what we need, but to fit it into their framework, right? And their framework is actually one that's not so far off from our framework. Because in our framework, what do we need? We need a lot of money, right? And we need some sort of contracts attached to that money, which, which represents some sort of a monetary return on it. There needs to be a way to pay for it, right? People don't invest a dollar without getting a dollar back. And it's just a matter of what their cost of capital and what the time is. The great thing about the capital markets is they don't need it back today. They don't need it back tomorrow. They can have it back in a reasonable way over decades, right? That's OK. And, and, and by the way, if you think about it, that really is what our society created, right, with the incumbent utility business model. Right? You know, back a century or a century and a half ago, when we needed to start and build infrastructure from scratch, we needed an enormous amount of money. But that money, which is called infrastructure and which is all about uh, the building of the grid, was, was paid for up front and monetized, paid back every day and every month by all the consumers and all the businesses and all the government who pay a little bit in cents per kilowatt hour. So at the individual level, we're getting a good um, value proposition, right? Because we just turn on our lights and we get a bill at the end of the month and give or take, we feel it's a fair trade. We don't think about the billions of dollars invested. We really just think about the fact that we have electricity. Now what we're talking about is another layer on that, right? Which is all the uh, negative outcomes that can happen. So what we have to do as a group and as an, and, and as an industry and from an EMP and a resilience point of view is we have to understand how to translate what we need, which is a lot of money and a lot of change in infrastructure, into what the investment community wants to give us, which is money for long duration, low risk investments. And once we can productize and structure it in that way and figure out how to create the outcomes, we're in good shape because there's unlimited money. It's happening in distributed generation, right? So the leading edge of, uh, uh, of this charge, the leading edge of the charge, is this distributed generation revolution. And by itself, by itself, the advent of energy democracy, the advent of five, which is what we have now, and then 10, and then 20% of the power in the country being created from distributed, resilient, um, uh, low carbon or no carbon um, resources will create a more resilient grid in general, in general. Um, and it will, it will inter be integrated and work better because the second parts, if the first part is generation and the second part is transmission and the third part is, is distribution, those two parts can interoperate better when they know that it's distributed as long as the engineers set it up to work that way. Right? So, that, so the next phase of the grid operation is to, is to integrate that and anticipate that we've got a lot of distributed resource and figure out how, how to work on it that way which is not unlike my knowing that Chuck just told me he's got a lot of food at home, so I don't have to have it anymore because I know where he lives and he's my friend, right? So I'm going to go be in his, in his friend group as soon as, uh, as, soon as this happens, as long, as long as I can wander over to his house. Um, so I want to go a little bit more into what's happening um, from a business point of view and a finance market point of view between public service commissions uh, investors, uh, utilities, and, 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 how that, and how that's working. Because there's a lot of, of um, friction right now in the market. And, and the friction is, is holding back investment. So the, the great thing about our country is we, from an energy market's point of view, we're not the United States of America, right? We're 50 states. So we have 50 state public utility commissions, and we have a couple of hundred uh, utilities with different regulatory structures. So, so if, and, and everyone in the room knows that, and if, you, if one wants to understand what an opportunity is in North Carolina or New York or California or Hawaii or Idaho, you have to actually know it at the state level in order to know the answer. You, it's, it's not about, uh, there, there aren't federal, there are very few federal laws that apply to that. Um, so interestingly, because there are 50 states, that's pushing us closer to choice and democracy than having only the federal government apply these decisions. So New York State 
um, is taking a lead, which some people know with their structure, which is called reforming the energy vision. So they've, and they talk about energy democracy a lot, and they, and they use that word, and, and, and they are expressly, through the Public Service Commission, deregulating and decoupling, which goes beyond deregulating, the nature of who owns and who provisions generation versus transmission versus uh, distribution. Because those are three very, th those three elements require different capital, right? They have different time horizons, different forms of investment return. And in fact, functionally and engineering and from a technology point of view, they're very different businesses. We understand why in the past they've been managed as the same business because there was no way around it, right? We now, and New York State is, is, le is among the leaders in, in, de in determining how to, how to rechange re their mix. We now have the opportunity to bring um, not only energy democracy but energy capitalism in and allow investors to separately and from a competitive point of view uh, invest in, own, and provision those different elements. And the investors will decide, whether, and, they're, and they're deciding all these things, whether they want to do it for a coal plant or whether they want to do it for a hydro plant or whether they want to do it for a nuclear plant or whether they want to do it for um, a solar plant, and, and in the fullness of time, all those things are happening um, and, and uh, will happen. Um, another word from a capital markets point of view about how this is growing and where it's going. So in 2008, just to benchmark a number, there were in solar, which as I told you is about two-thirds of all the, the um, renewable energy invested in, in America, there was $5 billion in the whole United States of America invested in solar. In the capital markets, that's a really, really small number. In the incumbent energy markets, that's a small number. And obviously, $5 billion in the whole country was widely distributed as to where it was, although a lot of it was in California in, in that year. Um, this year, it's about $25 billion. So between 2008 and now, we've grown five times. And, and I just told you that the costs have come down by 80%. So obviously the number of units in the 25 billion is a lot bigger than the number of units in the 5 billion. So it's growing really nicely and really astronomically. All of that money, the 25 billion, is what I would tell you to think of as primary market investment, meaning that's the cost of building a new plant somewhere. We're gonna put solar on the roof of this building, we're gonna put a 100 megawatts out in Loudoun County, whatever it is, it's, it's, a, it's the direct cost of the installation and provisioning of the new plant. So let's just call that the primary market. A lot of people probably know that the capital markets work very efficiently when they can figure out how to lower the cost of capital, right? So if I, if I um, come to Jerry and say, have I got a deal for you? And uh, here's what it looks like. And he says, that's great. I've got a 10% cost of capital. Therefore, I need this return. I, well, I have to work it into your equation. Remember, we can't change the, the um, investor's uh, point of view we have to understand their point of view and fit what we're doing into their equation. By contrast, if I go to Jerry with the same of everything and I say I've got, and he says I've got a 6% cost of capital, Jerry's going to finance a lot more of my deals because a lot more will, will, will bank if he's got a lower cost of capital. So the trick that's going on uh, through the distributed generation revolution is to structure and productize the investment so it's less bespoke, more productized, so that in, the more simplified it becomes, the more the capital markets can finance at a lower cost of capital. The capital markets have a trick as to how they do that. It's called the secondary market. So again, most people in this room and most people in industry, when they think of secondary markets, they don't think about any form of energy, right? You think of the mortgage-backed security market, you think about the asset-backed securities markets, you may know that there are secondary markets for credit card loans. You probably know that in the old days, if you went and got a home loan, a mortgage on your house, a 30-year mortgage, the bank that you went to, you'd sit down with the bank, and they'd actually not only underwrite you, but they'd own that loan on their balance sheet. Well, that's, that's very old-fashioned, and that hasn't happened in 10 or 20 years. Today, if you go and you apply for a loan, the person who's um, giving you the loan and underwriting you for the loan is not the organization or institution who's going to own the loan. They're going to keep it for a very short amount of time and they're going to sell it into the secondary markets. And that, for our society, 
has, brought, has, has, has allowed a broadening of home ownership, huge broadening of home ownership because it's brought down the cost of capital for residential mortgages. So that's an example of what has also happened for a couple of trillion dollars of investments through uh, broader asset classes, which are called asset-backed securities. So we're just at the front edge in energy of applying asset-backed securities financial technology to allow us to resell our assets in the secondary market. What does that mean? Um, the capital markets, as I've said three times now, love long-duration, low-risk investments, which has nothing about energy. Well, what is an energy investment? Fundamentally, energy investments are pretty nice. You put in a lot of money up front, you get a contract with someone, they're going to pay you a long-term stream of cash flows, whether it's a lease or a power purchase agreement, but pretty much no one invests in an, a large energy anything, right, without someone, uh, without knowing uh, what they're going to get paid for it, by con and, and it's usually by contract. Those contracts can be resold and structured as cash flow payments. So just like the mortgage market, right, allows, uh, has, has facilitated a movement, so there are originators and then there are secondary market holders, the energy market is at the front edge of that. And in, in total in the United States, there's been um, about $15 billion of secondary market transactions in renewable energy. So that's going to be pretty good. Um, it, we're, it's, I would say we're in our early, very early adolescence. It's not uh, attractive. Um, it's not yet productized, uh, but it's happening. Um, and the fact that there is a forming secondary market is absolutely critical to the growth. Because I will tell you that while we've grown in the primary market from 5 billion to 25 billion between 2008 and now, and there are tons and tons and tons of studies by um, large, large well-known companies who are saying that this is going to be a, a trillion dollar market or a 250 billion dollar market. It's going to be, you know, like Crazy Eddie said, it's going to be big, really big. But however big it's going to be, I will tell you we can't get much beyond the 25 billion without a well-formed secondary market. So the next thing to watch for as we go from 25 to 50 to 100 billion dollars in annual new investment um, in uh, distributed generation in the United States and, and in renewable energy, whether it's distributed or centralized, uh, is the formation of the secondary market to support and finance these transactions. And what they do is they allow other people to build them and invest in them. And then those who build them invest take their contracted amounts and resell them to other people, which is, just, which is a way of getting some of their money back. Right? So, so again, if Jerry and I have to put $100 million out of our own pocket, and he looks like he's got it, um, we probably, we probably want to have someone else uh, pay us back at some point. And, and, and the good, a, a great way to do that and a, and a cool way to do that is, in fact, for us to put our $100 million in um, and resell the cash flows because when we do that, we still own the underlying asset, right? And we, still, and, and we greatly leverage um, our capital position. And that hap that's happened in, in every other industry. What's cool about um, the distributed generation revolution is we're at the front end of taking that finance technology and applying it to energy. Uh, in many cases for the first time. So this is all going to happen uh, and is happening around us, right? It's happening, uh, it's happening across energy. It, it's happening in large part around um, clean energy. Um, it's led by solar. It's, it's, it's led by wind. Um, there, there's a lot of biofuel stuff going on. Uh, there's a lot of, there's just a, there, there, there's just a lot um, of, of financial structuring happening which can happen once the technology and the product part is de-risked. So now that the technology and the product of clean energy is de-risked, the capital markets are now able to come in and apply finance technology, which is the wave which, is, which provides the, the kind of booster rockets um, to get it to the tens of billions and then the hundreds of billions of dollars. So that's where it is. So what I would advise this group as we think slightly differently about the grid, and, and we think about everything that's being talked about um, from an EMP and a resilience and a, and, and a p potential disaster point of view, think about how to bring more money in. 
And the way to bring more money in is to fit in, right, and, and to fit in to the way the capital markets crowds look at things. The good thing about um, microgrids, the good thing about distributed generation, the, thing, the good thing about having backup, the good thing about having some form of alternate sourcing is increasingly that's financeable on a capital markets basis. So again, if, 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 um, if, if Chuck and I were on the board of a hospital 10 years ago and someone asked the CEO of the hospital, what's our plan in the case of a disaster? What are we going to do if the power goes out? Well, nearly 100% of the hospitals in the country would have answered the question the same way. They would have said, well, sir, ma'am, we have a backup plan. We have invested in generators. There they are. This is what they cost. We fix them every year. We, we bring enough oil in, and, 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 and the generators are going to take care of our problem. What we know as a society today is that it, it, two things have happened. Number one, that's a terrible answer, right, because the generators really are not resilient. They don't provide backup and they don't work for very long. So it's, it's really not an acceptable answer. It was an okay answer a decade ago, not because it was a great answer, it was the only answer. It was the only answer. What I'm telling you in 2015, and, and from now forward, is we now have technology at a cost, and infrastructure at a cost, that there are much better answers. And by investing in and creating local generation, and having the local generation be, be enough of a subset, with storage that it can actually um, not only be paid for day in and day out by being a, for, a, a big subset of the energy that you're actually using, but then by also being there to generate the power uh, in the case of, of the power going out. That's a huge win, and, 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 and that is going to help drive um, uh, energy democracy as we move along. So Chuck, thanks so much for inviting me, and good luck today for everybody.